Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest today was born in Braintree, Massachusetts, and he practiced law in Boston until he was selected to represent Massachusetts at the Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia. He was also ambassador to France, Holland, and England, and served as vice president in the administration of George Washington. So please welcome our second president, John Adams. My grandfather's grandfather came from York, England in the 1640s, and he settled in Massachusetts. And uh, not only did he just settle in Massachusetts, he had 89 grandchildren. So when someone whose last name is Adams comes up to me and says, President Adams, do you think we're related? I always say, well, how could we not be? <laughs> but anyway, my father was a simple farmer in Braintree, Massachusetts. A lot of people thought the Adamses were rich. Maybe Sam Adams, who was 15 years older than I was, was rich and his father was rich. And basically, our, our fathers were cousins. So we were like second cousins. But um, my father, uh, when he couldn't go out to the fields in the winter time, he would uh, sit at home and become a cobbler, and he would repair people's shoes. The Adamses were not intellectuals. My father never went to college, and my mother could not read. However, when I was 16, my father sold several acres of his farm, imagine the sacrifice, and used the money to pay my tuition so that I could attend the local community college called Harvard. And uh, uh, my father wanted me to become a minister. And uh, indeed, my father himself wanted to become a minister, but he couldn't because he did not have a college degree, which was a requirement of the Puritan church at the time. And uh, so uh, he did the, the thing that you know, a lot of fathers do. They impose, they impose the things that they didn't accomplish on their son to do. But, uh, you know, my, uh, most of my uh, uh, graduating class at Harvard went on to become clergymen. But when I graduated, I told my father that I wanted to become a lawyer which was a profession considered several tiers below that of a minister, even then. And uh, my father and I argued about this career choice, and we finally compromised that I would spend two years teaching school in Worcester, Massachusetts, while I thought over my <coughs> desire to become a lawyer. And indeed, that's that's what I did. And, uh, and initially I thought that those two years of teaching school would be a complete waste of time. Uh, but I later realized that it was through teaching that I learned the most important skill I was able to use for the rest of my life. And that was teaching taught me how to be persuasive. Because if you can persuade a 13-year-old to do the right thing, you can persuade <coughs> anybody to do the right thing. Even a Congress sitting in Philadelphia. Do we have any teachers? Former? No, no teachers here. Well, one, you, teacher. one teacher. Oh, well, well, thank you for your for your service. Thank you for your service. And one of the things that I learned. Uh, by being a teacher was the importance of education. And I could see, even during that two years, the transformation that was made but in the students just by being in my classroom. And in 17, um, in 1779, I was asked by the state of Massachusetts to write their first uh, state constitution. And when I wrote that state constitution, I put something in there that was not in any other state constitution. You know, there, all the states decided 
well, we're states now, we should have our own constitution. So they all wrote their own constitution and the thing that I put in there, which I only put in because I had been a teacher and I knew the power of education was that the state of Massachusetts and the municipality had the requirement to support universal education for all boys and girls. There was no other state constitution that ever spoke about education, but ours did. And there was an interesting case uh, about 20 years ago where some town was, was uh, suing the uh, state of Massachusetts because the Department of Education said that they hadn't paid enough into their budget for the schools and uh, ultimately this, the, uh, the town lost and they were made to pay that money and this, the uh, court quoted from the state constitution the section that I wrote which was still there intact to say that the municipality had the obligation of supporting education. Well, after two years of teaching school, much to my father's disappointment, I started reading the law with a lawyer in, Boston, in uh, Worcester. And finally, I set up my own legal practice in my own home. And after two years, I moved my burgeoning practice to Boston, which was a big city then with a population of 15,000 people. 15,000 people, that's what went for a big city in colonial America. Total population of colonial America at that time was probably around three and a half to four million people, but almost everyone was on the farms. And uh, the, the biggest uh, city was Philadelphia, and it had a population of 45,000 group that I spoke to in Boston two months ago told me that now Boston has a population of 15,000 lawyers. But luckily not while I was there. <laughs> you know, early in my career as a lawyer and indeed growing up, I was proud to be an Englishman. I was proud of the history, the culture, the British laws and the form of government and especially the beautiful language. And to be patriotic meant to be loyal to the King of England. And we profess that loyalty in all public meetings like this by singing the song, God Save the King. And I remember singing it with such gusto and commitment. And I'll, I'll give you a, just a sample of it. So pretended this is the uh, 1750s and uh, we're singing, God Save the King. God save our gracious King, long live our noble King, God save the King, make him victorious, Happy and glorious to reign over us, God save the King. Ah. So, you know, sometimes I, I regret fomenting a revolution and losing that song, but not too many times. You know, another time, I remember feeling the, the pride of, uh, of being British when I heard that song was when I was a teacher in Worcester and there was a Bridget, a British regiment that was um, bivouacked for the night on the edge of town and they were <coughs> heading up to march to Canada to fight the French in the French and Indian War. This was the early uh, 1760s. And uh, we, the people in the town, were just so proud of these soldiers that we 
we went and we gave them all sorts of foods and things that they could carry with them and treats and stuff like that. And we uh, stood by their campfires that night and we sang, God save the king. Yet, there came a time that when hardly anyone wanted to sing that song anymore. And probably for most of us, the, the king was probably the last person we would have wanted God to save. <coughs> So what went so dreadfully wrong in that relationship between England and the American colonies? You know, I've often said that the war for independence started in 1775, but the American Revolution started in the hearts and the minds of the colonists more than 15 years before those shots were fired at Lexington and Concord. You see, it was the French and Indian War that really started it all, because after the British victory over the French, there was a huge debt that England had to, be, had to pay for its expenses of that war. You might say there was a financial crisis in London, and London decided that they would solve that financial crisis by telling the colonies to pay that debt. And we in the colonies said, well, that's totally unfair. England, you got from this war Canada. Now, isn't that a big enough prize? And what's more, we in places like New York and Boston and Charleston shouldn't be required to pay a tax when we had no representatives in London, at the House of Commons. No taxation was without representation was the way we put it. And um, this issue and this conflict escalated year after year and got worse and worse and more pronounced, especially in my hometown of Boston. Taxes were increased and the colonies' reaction was more and more vociferous, followed by soldiers, British soldiers, being garrisoned in all of the major cities in the colonies, including Boston. And this led to the worst incident in anyone's memory, the Boston Massacre of March 1770, when 14 British soldiers were uh, fired on a mob of 500 Bostonites one night, one cold March night, that was surrounding these 14 soldiers. And they were coming closer and closer, and they were throwing rocks and snowballs and oyster shells and just shouting, go ahead and shoot us, go ahead and shoot us. They came closer and closer and closer. And two of the soldiers were just so frightened they fired their weapons. And then, of course, everyone ran away except for the six bodies of colonists that lay in the street dead. What a shock, what a shock. So soldiers were arrested and charged with murder. And they were locked up. And I was asked the next day, if I would represent those soldiers against this charge of murder. And I knew that if I represented those soldiers, I would be the most hated man in Boston, wouldn't I? Even by my own clients. Or as Abigail said, you mean your former clients, John. <laughs> but, I did this because I did not want these soldiers to have a kind of rough mob justice, you know, just string them up, which would remind the rest of the world that Massachusetts hadn't progressed very far since the days 100 years before when we stoned Salem witches and we executed Quakers. People don't are aware of the execution of Quakers. It was not healthy to be a Quaker 
in Boston. And more important, I wanted to prove to myself that we lived by the rule of law. And obviously, this was a case of self-defense. The soldiers fired because they thought they were about to be trampled to death. And uh, the case is famous in jurisprudence because it is the first time in a colonial court where the judge instructed the jury that you cannot convict unless you are convinced of the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the first time that phrase was used in a court in, in colonial America. And, uh, you know, before, the burden of proof was just preponderance of the evidence, the more or less guilty sort of way of scales. With this ruling about beyond a reasonable doubt, a juror to convict, the juror must have no reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. And in my argument to the jury, I had to explain why is it that we seem to bend over backwards, as some would say, to protect the guilty. What's the basis for this in British common law and now in American courts? A lot of people ask that today. Why is it so difficult to convict guilty people? And the reason is, and this is what I said to the jury, it's more important to the community that innocence be protected than it is that guilt should be punished. More important to protect innocence. And that's the basis of all due process law from that massacre trial on forward. And in the end, all but two of the soldiers were found not guilty. I know you thought I got them all off, didn't you? Well, two were found guilty, but not of murder. They were found, uh, two were found guilty of something called manslaughter, which is a much lesser crime that basically says out of incompetence, out of negligence, out of fear, out of lack of control, they fired their weapons without really wanting to kill anybody. And it's a much lesser crime. And uh, so there, there were these two soldiers who were found guilty, but the judge said he was going to adjourn the court that day and come back tomorrow because he wanted counsel to study up on a special rule of law, uh, an ancient British rule called benefit of clergy. And he said that uh, he wanted us to study that and he thought there was something there that we might look into. And here's the judge, you know, and I'm a trial lawyer, and when a judge is giving you advice, he's giving you advice to help you and to help your client. Even if you think that the advice is totally wrong, you have to follow it. So my co-counsel and I, we, we, we looked up the rule benefit of clergy and it said that in a non-capital case, and this was a non-capital because it was manslaughter, not murder, if you have a clergyman who has committed that crime, the most a civil court could do to punish that clergyman was to have his thumbs branded. That was the biggest punch. But we said, well, that's nice, but these aren't clergymen. Oh, well, we had to play along with this judge for some reason. So that evening, uh, my co-counsel and I went and visited the two soldiers in their cell, and I brought a Bible with me, and I said, do either of you know any prayers? And one of them said, oh, yes, Mr. Adams, I was an older boy in England, and I served at so many funerals that I know the 23rd Psalm by heart. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I said, great, you will recite this tomorrow in court. 
And I said, and what about you? To the other soldier. He said, Mr. Adams, I haven't been to church in my life. Ooh. So I gave the Bible to the altar boy and I said, you teach him the 23rd Psalm. The next day, everybody was in that courthouse because they wanted to know what was going to happen to those two soldiers. What was the judge going to do? And uh, so he gabbled, and, and you know, in the court, and, and it was so filled up. You know, they had the windows open so people could on the street could try to hear what was going on. Anyway, he judged. He said, "All right, all right." Before I uh, uh, announce my sentence, I want to ask, do, do any counsel have anything further to offer? And I raised my hand, I said, yes, Your Honor, I want to offer evidence that proves that these two are clergymen. And with that, everyone in the court just laughed. Because it was ridiculous, these two were clergymen. He said, all right, and he, he and when they laughed, he judged the order, 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 all right, first witness. So we got the altar boy, and he recited the 23rd Psalm beautifully. And then we got the other soldier, and one of the problems was not only didn't he know any prayers, he didn't know how to read. So he didn't, <laughs> we tried to give him, so he, could, so he went to about the fourth line, and he was totally lost. And the judge interrupted him, all right, all right, I've heard enough. I will find that these two are clergymen, and they're to be sent out, and they're to have their thumbs branded with it, the letter M for manslaughter, and then be released to their units. And that was that. So there were six dead colonists and four branded thumbs. I thought I did a pretty good job, didn't you? But I thought, oh man, I am going to have to find a new place to practice law. I'm going to have to go to Philadelphia or Boston or whatever. But I really ultimately learned that the people of Boston respected the fact that I had defended these obnoxious clients because it was part of the rule of justice that when someone is, is uh, charged with a crime, he should have a good lawyer to represent him. And that is something that's sort of iconic that came down from the uh, Boston Massacre trial. You don't take it out on the lawyer because the lawyer is performing a function that everyone needs. And, um, so there I was. It also didn't hurt to have, as part of my uh, protection, my cousin, Sam Adams, because he was the head of the Sons of Liberty. And they, a few years later, they uh, were the ones who um, uh, put together the uh, Boston Tea Party. But he told all of his friends that they were not to touch John Adams because he was Sam Adams's cousin, so that helped me. You know, uh, understand that some of you are familiar with Sam Adams. You know, if not the man, at least the brew. And uh, I'm often asked, uh, do, do you like, do you like his lager or his ale or uh, what do you think? And I always say, well, my favorite alcoholic beverage is hard cider. And he does not make hard cider. So, uh, and I, every morning I have a full tankard, a pint of hard cider for, with breakfast. And when Abigail says, oh, John, must you? I said, Abigail, it's for my digestion, as well as my disposition, if you know what I mean. But that was, that's what the, the way, you know, those, those things. Uh, one of the things that showed how gracious the people were of Boston to me, even though I had to represent the Boston uh, Massacre defendants, was in 1774, there was a something called the Continental Congress that was formed 
by all the 13 colonies, and the colonies would, would send representatives to uh, their meetings in Philadelphia, and by this, there's the idea that the, the colonies would work together and would be, uh, uh, have a joint negotiations or settlement or global things. They didn't want England to be negotiating with a colony by colony by colony. They had to get us all at once. And uh, the Continental Congress was, was the way they did it. And my proudest moment at the Continental Congress was two years later when uh, in June of uh, 1776, when I was appointed the chairman of the committee that wrote the Declaration of Independence. Now, you know that Thomas Jefferson actually wrote it, but the committee members, including myself and Benjamin Franklin, were there to, to uh, give suggestions and edits as, as the thing went through. And so uh, when uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote that all men are created equal and endowed get the, the words right by their creator with certain inalienable rights amongst them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, I had to object. I said, he's using the word happiness. I said to Franklin, Happiness, that's a mere emotion. It's not a positive good or virtue. How will people know what happiness is unless you define it in the text? But Franklin just laughed. This was, you know, Jefferson was upstairs writing away, and two of us were debating on this happiness deal. And Franklin just laughed the way he always laughed when he disagreed with. It was a very annoying thing. He said, John, let's leave Jefferson's language the way it is, because outside of Massachusetts, everyone knows what happiness is. <laughs> Two years later, when we were both ambassadors from the Continental Congress to Paris, I discovered that for Franklin, the pursuit of happiness clearly meant the pursuit of women. And speaking of women, you know, Abigail would have been a very good president, but she never would have put up, subjected herself to the nasty presidential campaigns that have marked all of American history right from the beginning. And those of you who think that character assassination and slash and burn tactics are recent creations should study the presidential campaign of 1800 when I ran unsuccessfully for a second term opposed by Thomas Jefferson, who was the eventual winner. And one of my critics in that campaign stated that John Adams is mentally deranged and subject to uncontrollable emotional fits and is at times absolutely mad. And this critic was Alexander Hamilton. You've heard of him? The first Treasury Secretary and a member of my own Federalist Party, and Hamilton was mad at me because he wanted to become the new general of the National Army. And when he asked if he could have that position, I said, well, Alexander, you know, I, I just disbanded the National Army a week ago. Ah. So mad at me. You know, when people looked at Hamilton, and I'm talking about people like Jefferson and myself, we saw in Hamilton the American Napoleon Bonaparte, who had a lot of ideas and power and had the ability to do things, and you had to watch him. But in any case, there was Hamilton. And um, four years after Hamilton wrote these terrible things about me, he was killed in a duel with Vice President Aaron Burr. Who my understanding was not the last Vice President to shoot somebody. 
And uh, so you think th things are tough now, but here's, here's the, the former Treasury Secretary killed by the Vice President of the United States. So we, we had our problems too. And there was a huge funeral for Hamilton in New York City when I was asked if I attended it. I said no, but I approved of it. My political enemies even tried to create a scandal about me. A scandal about me. They said that when I was ambassador to London, my fellow ambassador, Charles Pinckney, had hired four mistresses, four mistresses, two for him and two for me. And when I was asked about that charge, I said, anybody who would think that I had a mistress, let alone two mistresses, had never ever met Abigail Adams. Charges against uh, Jefferson were just as scurrilous, including the charge that he was an atheist, which after all my discussions about religion with Jefferson, I knew not to be true. Now, Abigail could not stand any of this. He said, she said, when you hurt him, I am the one who bleeds. And presidential politics has always been an American blood sport, especially hard on the candidates' families. Now, uh, I have to say that I have another love other than Abigail, and that is the love of books. And Abigail used to say that the Adamses would have been as wealthy as those aristocrats, the Madisons and the Monroes, if it weren't for our husband's practice of spending all of our money on books. And indeed, we I had a private library with 3,000 volumes of books. 3,000. Most of them were bought from a London bookseller. And the only person in the colony who had a larger library was Thomas Jefferson, and he had 7,500 books. Uh, you know, in the War of 1812. Oh, uh, getting ahead of myself. Um, the <clears throat> On March 24th, 1800, as president, I had the honor of buying, with an appropriation of $5,000, 470 books from a, boss, a, a London bookseller, along with 17 maps. And most of the books were on the subjects of the law, government, and science. And books were so important to us in America because we had no experts in America. All the experts were in London, or in Paris, or in Italy, or in Germany. And the most that we could do was to buy their books and get the benefit of their knowledge. And uh, <clears throat> so these books were so essential. I want to give you an example <clears throat> of how powerful a book was. And it's the story of Henry Knox. Henry Knox, 1775, was a bookseller in Boston. And he was only 24 years old. He was a very fat young man. He was so enthusiastic about books, but he was enthusiastic about one subject of books that he bought every book that was printed in the English language, he had a copy of it on the subject of cannons. Cannons, artillery science. How do you make them? How do you aim them? How do you move them? How do you build fortifications to hold them? And he had 16 different books on artillery science that he had bought. And this was his like little private library. He loved artillery science. So, <clears throat> when the British occupied Boston in 1775, Henry Knox closed up his bookshop and took his books on artillery science, 
across the Charles River and tried to join some of the militias. And all the militias had come from the different parts of the country to, to, to fight the British. They were here, there were 9,000 British soldiers in Boston, surrounded by about 15,000 militia outside of Boston. And this went from the spring, of, it started in the spring of 1775. And so when uh, poor Henry Knox tried to join these, you know, he was just this big fat kid. And they, uh, uh, but the thing that he did was he went around and he looked at the fortifications that were being, had been built around Boston to keep the British under control or to do things. And he, using his books, had built some pretty good looking fortifications. And in fact, when, John, when uh, George Washington and uh, Marquis de Lafayette were inspecting uh, fortifications in Roxbury, they looked at the fortifications and they said, my God, this looks like it was built by a professional army engineer. So they asked them, who built this thing? How would you get the designs? What was it? Oh, there's this big fat boy, and he has all these books on how to put. So he had advised us on the whole thing. What's his name? Henry Knox. Henry Knox. Washington just tried to say, okay, I remember that. We have to, we have to find that fellow. So anyway, so here, uh, what happened was in 1775, the British had enough uh, soldiers so that they couldn't be defeated by the Americans, and the Americans had enough soldiers so they couldn't be defeated by the British. And there was a stalemate. There were some terrible battles, including the Battle of Bunker Hill or Breed's Hill, where there were a thousand casualties on either side, which were, were just it, it, extraordinary. So that it went from spring to summer to fall, and now it's approaching winter. And Henry Knox has a great idea of how to throw the British out of Boston. And he knows he has to tell it to George Washington, whom he had never met. But he goes to George Washington's headquarters on Brattle Street in Boston. It's now the Longfellow House. And he knocks on the door, and the guard comes and says, yes. And this is, you know, Washington's headquarters. And uh, he says, I want to speak to General Washington. Guard looks and says, "Now, who are you? Are you with any uh, group?" Because he didn't really, have, he didn't have even a uniform, you know. No, I'm not. Oh, and what was your, uh, what was your civilian occupation? He says, "Bookseller." So he says, uh, "I'm sorry, uh, you know, the general is not out, but it's not here. But I, you know, he, he's very busy. I don't do. What, what, what do you want?" Well, I have an idea of how to throw the British out of Boston. And I want to tell them what it is. Well, you have to come back another time. So four days later, comes back. And this time, he says, no, no, the general's away on, on some inspections and this and that. He has all this. He comes back a third time more. Finally comes back the fourth time in a week. And this time, General Washington is actually in his headquarters, and he's having a major conference with his highest staff people. And so the, uh, see, the guard says, oh, Washington is, let me see what I can do. So he goes in and he says, uh, General, there's this young man and he, now he's here for the fourth time. And he says he has to talk to you because he has an idea of how to throw the British out of Boston. And every, all the staff just laugh. <laughs> and Washington turns to them and says, well, none of you have had an idea of how to throw the British out of Boston, right? 
We've been doing this for nine, now, nine, nine, nine months, and now it's the mid-November, and we still are in the same position we were in the spring. Who is this man? Do you know his name? And the guard says, yes, his name is Henry Knox. George Washington remembered that was the that was the name of the fellow who built those wonderful um, formations and, uh, and, and and it looked like a professional army engineer had done. So he said, "Well, let's bring this this young man in. We can talk to him." So he comes in, and George Washington says, uh, "Well, tell me." What is your idea? You have an idea of how to throw the British out of Boston? What is it? So he says, well, General, when um, uh, we uh, uh, captured Fort Ticonderoga at the southern end of Lake Champlain, there are 59 cannon in Fort Ticonderoga that we also captured. And they're still there, all 59 cannon. And those cannon are bigger than any cannons than the British have here in Boston. They're so immense. And of course, they're bigger than any of our cannons because we have no cannon. Yes. And I suggest that we take those cannons and bring them to Boston and put them on Dorchester Heights, pointing down at the British Navy in the harbor and their encampment in Boston. And when they see that, they'll leave like that. So, so uh, one of the staff says, oh, Mr. Knox, you know. It's getting to be winter. There's already ice and snow in the Berkshires that we'd have to go over. You can't move cannon in the winter time. And, and uh, Knox shakes his head, no, 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 no. That's exactly the time that you have to move huge cannons. That's the only two. Because what you do is you put them on sleds. And you slide the sleds with the oxen and uh, it slides over the snow and the ice. And he says, I could take those cannons and have them in Dorchester Heights in five weeks. Oh, have you ever moved cannons, Mr. Knox? No, I haven't. Well, how do you know all about this? You're just a 24-year-old. So, well, I've read a lot about it. Oh, you've read a lot about it. And how did you read a lot about it? From artillery science books, I have 11 of them. Well, do you have any one of those books right now that talks about moving cannons in the wintertime? Well, yes, I do. And he had, had brought one. Well, uh, and Washington said, all right, all right, this, Mr. Knox, find in that book what you're talking about. So it finds a page in the book, and he gives it to Washington. And Washington takes the book, and he reads it, and he turns the page, and then he closes the book. And he says to his staff, give that young man whatever he wants. And on March 3rd, 1776, the British awoke in Boston. They looked up on Dorchester Heights, and there were an array of 59 cannons pointing down. It was done overnight. It was a, just an amazing thing that they, they were able to put them all in place. And, that, it was just, and the British general said, I've never seen such a, a ability of, of a group of people of no military background moving these things so quickly. So the British general, General Howe, he tried to see if they could, you know, elevate their cannon to point it, but it, 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 the, the angle was too much. So he, he asked for a special parley, 
and with the representatives of Howe and representatives of Washington, they had a, um, a discussion. And General Howe's representative said, if you fire those cannons on our troops or on our ships, I will make sure that everything in Boston is burnt to the ground. So anyway, so they went back and they told Washington. And Washington, you know, was, was not just a military man, but he was a politician. He knew how to do things, and he knew that he would be hated by everyone in Boston if he took some really great pot shots, maybe killed a lot of British soldiers, but ended up destroying Boston. So he says, all right. This is what I do. I will give you two weeks to leave. And if you leave in those two weeks, I will not use those cannons. And General Howe said, all right. So on March 17, 1776, all of the 9,000 soldiers, plus 2,000 Tories, people who lived in Boston but didn't want to live under American rule, got into those ships and those ships left and went to Halifax, Nova Scotia. And that day is still remembered today as Evacuation Day. Very important day. And if you go to Boston on March 17, and their parades and all these things. A lot of people from out of town, they just think they're somehow rep you know, remembering the patron saint of Ireland, right? But it's not. They're, they're remembering Evacuation Day, and if there's a patron saint of Evacuation Day, who should it be? Henry Knox, right? So what happened to Henry Knox? What happened to Henry Knox was that on uh, as he when, when he brought all of his cannons to Dorchester Heights, um, Washington was there to greet him, and he had a certificate signed by John Hancock, the president of the Continental Congress, that made Henry Knox a full colonel. Six months later, Henry Knox was made a general. And that is for all of his things that he did when he, uh, when they uh, attacked Trenton on Christmas Day and battled the Hessian troops. And then 12 years after that, Henry Knox became a member of George Washington's cabinet as Secretary of War. So pretty good for a person who used those foreign books and got and got the liberation of Boston without firing a shot. You know, I wanted to uh, finish by telling you a story of George Washington. And George Washington, in 1777, the winter, it was December, was about to lose his whole army. He would lose his whole army, and he wouldn't lose it because he was attacked by the British. And he wouldn't lose it because his men are sick. And he wouldn't lose it for all sorts of basic things that you would lose an army for. He would lose his army because their enlistments were up on December 31st, and they all could just go home. And they wouldn't be AWOL, and they wouldn't be deserters. They could just go home. And he had to figure out a way of convincing them to re-up for another year, at least. So he had all of his troops, this is the mid-December, out on 
uh, the fairgrounds, and they were all in order, and there were about 12,000 soldiers. And he has on his, on his horse, and he had his full general's uniform, with the epaulets and all the whole thing. And he told his men that he had gotten the permission from the Continental Congress to issue a special one-month bonus to any of the troops who would sign up for another year. And that meant you got a one-month bonus. And um, the pay for a soldier at that time for one month was $10, equivalent to probably like uh, $5,000 in today's money. So it was something, but it was just $10. So he said to his soldiers, if you will sign up, you and will get next year a one-month bonus, which I think is very generous. Now, he said, and he looked at the troops, he said, now everyone who will sign up for this one-month bonus, please step forward. He looked all around, and no one stepped forward. Nobody. Nobody of the 12th hour, they just still stayed there and looked at him. So Washington turned his horse and he galloped about a hundred yards away and he just stopped there. And there the men looked at him and he was looking down in deep thought. And then he turned his horse back and he rode back to his troops and he said these words, if you will come with me the next six months we could do more in that time than you could accomplish if you went home and lived another 50 years. And more than your children could do or your children's children could do. Because in the next six months, we can protect and defend this nation, the United States of America. whose liberty will be a blessing for all your sons and your daughters. Now who will serve with me, Washington? And everyone step forward. And all those soldiers knew that Washington was no longer talking about $10, was he? He wasn't talking about $10. He was talking about this self-sacrifice or something, this concept that was called America, and that all these soldiers knew they had to do it. Now, I want to finish off by singing a song that's really on that, that subject. It, it's, it's a song about America and its legacy of sacrifice that has been with us right from the beginning. And it was, this song was sung by uh, Nora Jones in uh, Ken Burns' documentary on the Second World War in 2008. And it was uh, later, also uh, sung later in 2008 by an Air Force sergeant at the dedication of the 9-11 memorial at the Pentagon. And uh, it's a beautiful song that I myself have uh, been asked many times to sing it and play it for funerals of veterans. And it's called America, I Gave My Best to You. the 
those who came before a dream of a nation where freedom would endure the whole work and the prayers of centuries have brought us to this day what shall be our legacy what shall our children say let them say of me i was one who believed in sharing the blessings i received let me know in my heart when my days are through america america i gave my best to you Thank you very much, and may God bless you, and God bless the United States.